Um, so my name is Tammy Rumenap, as Jan said. Thank you. This is Jake. Um, so I'm going to start with doing kind of an overview of the Wound Care Center um, and kind of give you some statistics and some general information on what we do. And then Jake's going to take over and get into some of the nitty gritty, more medical stuff of his daily tasks and the types of wounds that we treat. Um, and kind of how things work. So uh, just to give you some history on our center, we are the uh, My Michigan Wound and Hyperbaric Medicine Treatment Center. We opened in April of 2019. We are housed at My Michigan uh, Medical Center, Alpena, just right, right over. <laughs> um, but we are actually owned and operated by Hologix. So it's a great partnership. Um, Hologix kind of handles, um, you'll see in the next slide, so a certain portion, whereas my Michigan gives us the collaboration, the medical care um, and things like that. Since we've opened, we are very fortunate that um, we have been able to help a lot of people. So we've helped 1,462 new patients. Um, we have had 16,287 wound visits, just quite a lot of wound visits. Um, we're gonna be talking about hyperbaric treatment today. And for that, we've had 79, pa that can't, 79 patients and 2,223 treatments. So um, quite a few treatments there. Yes. 79 patients. How do we get to that many treatments? I'm sorry. Yeah, so. Divide 79 into 2,200 to get the number of treatments, treatments per person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a typical treatment is anywhere from 20 to 40, and it's typically 40 treatments. Um, so you could see how you would get that large of a number. And sometimes we go up to 60, depending on the patient. Um, so our patient satisfaction, one of the things I like to talk about this, if I like to brag on my team a little bit here, this is all Jake and our nurses and our medical assistants, our HBO techs. Um, they just do an awesome job in the rooms. They make sure that our patients are being listened to, they're being heard. And you can see that in our patient satisfaction scores. It's 96.6%. Um, our median days to heal. So from the time that a patient walks in the door as a new patient till the time that Jake is saying, all right, you're healed, have a great life. On average, that's about 23 days. So that's pretty great. And we're talking about sometimes we see wounds that have been there for months, years. Obviously, longer the, the longer amount of time that that wound has been present, the longer it's going to take to heal. Um, and then our outlier rate is 8.6%. And that is um, people kind of fall outside of our, our normal um, uh, medium, median days to heal of that 23. So there may be some other um, underlying conditions that go along with that. Could you identify a wound? What, what is your... Yes, we're going to get into that. Absolutely. Well, some fun with those slides. Yeah, we got some fun <laughs> slides for you. <laughs> Um, so, um, we do, Heologix does have 600 centers, um, in the U S and we have a few in Europe and where I said, kind of my Michigan houses, uh, the center, the center, um, my Michigan provides Jake for us, um, where, uh, Heologix, um, kind of what they provide in the partnership is, um, we do some revenue cycle management. So kind of handling the financial aspects of it, um, marketing and clinical education. That's a big part of my job. So I go out to the different, uh, doctors in the area, different providers, and I provide community education, just kind of let them know we're here, what we're doing. We do provide progress notes to primary care physicians so that we're working with them in collaboration um, on these patients that are coming to see us. They're still going back to see their primary care provider, getting that care. And then it's just a great team approach. Um, Hologix does a lot of research and we do that research to make sure that we're using evidence-based practices and that we're using the best evidence-based approaches that we can to heal those wounds as quickly as we can. And then we um, we also support the hyperbarics program. And like I said, we're going to get into that, do a deep dive into that in a little bit. Um, one other thing that I like to brag on my team about, because they just rocked it out of the park in 2022, we were just recognized for um, the uh, Center of Distinction and the Clinical Excellence Award. So what we look at when those awards are given out in their national awards are the patient satisfaction, 
how, uh, what is the percentage of patients that we're healing? And it has to be over 78% and we're at like 88%. Um, and uh, our outlier rate, which we already talked about. And then the Clinical Excellence Award, um, our team received that for being in the top percent of centers in the country for healing. So it's not like a money driven, it's about healing and those patient outcomes. So I like to brag because my team kind of rocks, they're doing lots of great healing. So to start, what is what is a chronic wound? So what uh, what is kind of that definition? Um, it's an insult or injury that has failed to progress through a normal, orderly and timely repair process to produce anatomic and functional integrity. That's a lot of words. So we'll just get into some cool pictures in a minute. But essentially, it's saying that we have an injury, we have a, um, a wound of some sort, an ulcer, um, a pressure sort of that's not healing for some reason. So why is wound care important? Well, wound care is important because we're seeing it, we see a lot of wounds out there. And this is kind of a cool chart just to show you, um, this is how many uh, our population. Um, by age. And you can kind of see, you know, in the 60s, we had this nice little like skinny kind of cone thing here. And we're really flattening out here, you can see. So the median age for someone who would come to our center is 62 years old. And they say plus or minus 14 years in there. So I did just a nice big graph here. And you can see how many more people are needing wound care now. So it's really important that they have access to that. We do a lot of treatments and we're gonna talk about those advanced um, treatments that we do that a primary care provider just isn't able to provide. Um, so it is very, very important. Yes. Why is there such a large increase projected for 2060 as opposed to 1960? Because people kept having babies. It's just it's, that's just the population. That population. That's just a general population. That's not for wound care. Because of the numbers of people, not necessarily an increase in the kind of problem. Correct. Yeah. Great question. So, Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. So it fits our aging population that we know we have a much lower quantity of younger people comparably to aging population. I mean, pretty. You did have to mention that aging, but I said it. I said it. But I think I said it gracefully, didn't I? That's, that was not smooth. All right, I'll work on that. I'll work on the delivery. <laughs> it's not the goal. We're, our goal is to do our goal is to do everything we can to prolong that. Exactly. <laughs> so we love it. Did you have a question? Okay. Good. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. So I'm going to, the next couple of slides, I'm going to bore you with some statistics, but I'm going to try and spice it up a little bit. Um, but it also goes into why is wound care so important? So 6.7 million, almost 7 million Americans right now have a chronic non-healing wound. One in four family members, families have a family member with a chronic wound. I put this statistic in there because Jake and I were doing a talk back in September, I think. And um, one of the women had called me afterwards and said, hey, I have to tell you, we went to your talk, my sister and I, and when we left, she said, hey, Betty, I don't think that was her name, but we'll say, hey, Betty, that wound on that slide, that's exactly what you have on your foot. Maybe you should go see the wound care team. So the family members can really help kind of check on your loved ones, um, check on your advanced age. Is that I don't, uh, members? I, it apparently wasn't graceful enough. So take another shot at it. <laughs> you know, check. And we say April is foot health month. So make sure you're checking your feet and checking people that you care for. Just take a quick look um, and see if there's if you see any wounds there. That woman did, in fact, have a chronic wound. We were able to heal it within that median time frame, so it was a great outcome. Um, a really big kind of something for you to think about is if we're not treating those chronic wounds, thirty percent of them end up resulting in an amputation. And once you have an amputation, we really see that quality of life decreases. So we want to get in there <clears throat> and heal those wounds, try to avoid anything like that. Um, and then talking about it from a money side. Chronic wounds have a $50 billion impact on the healthcare system every year. So that's a pretty big impact. Um, 
The most common diseases that we're seeing that we see in the wound care center associated with wound care is diabetes and uh, heart disease and vascular disorders. So we definitely want to be watching for that. Over 34 million people in the U.S. right now currently have, are living with diabetes. Um, and you get those diabetic ulcers, and Jake's going to talk about it, but they can start as a pinhole and just blow up fast. Um, of the uh, percentage of people with diabetes who end up with amputation, 85% of those started with just a small foot ulcer. So we need to watch for that. All right, this is my last numbers. Don't worry, guys. <laughs> 121.5 million Americans have some form of cardiovascular disease. I mean, we're just really not a super healthy country. Um, and with that kind of statistic, we see 82% of lower leg amputations are due to poor circulation. So um, Jake, again, and the team work with that and they work with uh, other providers, vascular surgeons um, to make sure that they're providing the best care. So we're not seeing that. All right. I know I said no more numbers, but this is a really kind of scary slide and it really hits home. So for diabetic related wounds and amputations, so once somebody with diabetes has an amputation, they have a, uh, after five years, there's a 50% mortality rate. So that's huge. That's a big number um, that we're talking about after five years. I mean, that's more than breast cancer and prostate cancer put together. Um, so it is really important that we're treating these wounds. All right, so types of wounds that we treat, I'm not gonna read through them, but you can kind of read through them. Um, and then I'm gonna pass it on to Jake now and he's gonna kind of go through the, the main ones that we see. I highlighted diabetic ulcer success, number one. I'll tell you a little uh, bit more. Oh, about and we didn't even get a warning for everybody. So. Oh, sorry. Oh, I think that's what you're about to do. And yeah, then I was gonna give a quick up. warning before we start. So well, quick. Um, a little glimpse into what I get to do every day. Um, wow. I, fortunately, I get I, I love it. So um, number one uh, is on most lists. It is the highest percentage of of uh, wound that we see in our wound care center, highest volume. Some of the worst outcomes are diabetic foot ulcers. Um, so these are some pictures to get an idea. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight on this, you know, these we of course try and have impact with these and it's not um it's not just to make sure you can't sleep at night and you have nightmares but so you can associate these things with real life because they do exist other and, and this patient is usually walking around they have socks and shoes on they you don't know that there's a wound on their foot so this is something really to be aware of so but it can certainly got a wound like that in the uh, oftentimes they don't check it um, there isn't, they don't have pain and sensation like you would expect. Um, they might know when it gets to some of these large areas, but as Tammy mentioned, um, they can start as pinholes and that can get to this point pretty quickly. But I just wanted to point out the, the you know, and this was the pinhole portion that I was going to uh, kind of exemplify. So it can start out as something as small as that. And within days to weeks, we can have a completely different picture. Um, pressure ulcers, um, another, uh, high percentage, um, this is just slightly less than diabetic ulcers in our clinic when we look at our distribution of wounds, but um, pressure ulcers, bed sores, they've been referred to um, in every bit of severity along the way. Arterial ulcers. So Tammy had mentioned peripheral vascular disease, problems with, with blood flow. Um, this is an example of wounds that come from problems with blood flow down your leg. So delivery of blood, to your extremity. They have that punched out appearance. Venous leg ulcer. This is my favorite slide. This is the wound um, that I'm usually the happiest that we get to see. And unfortunately, by the time we get to see these, um, people have been dealing with this for a long time. They've probably taken 15 scripts of antibiotics. Um, everyone's looked at it and put a different type of Band-Aid or, or salve or something on the wound. But the reason that these exist is because the veins are incompetent. So you have valves in your veins. They help bring blood back up to your heart, return the blood from your feet. And uh, they these valves over a period of time and from different disorders, they start to leak. And as they leak, 
that blood pools out. You can see the discoloration in the leg that's very typical. Sometimes it starts with swelling, cramping, varicose veins. Um, those are the early stages and then ultimately non-healing ulcers. Um, with proper care, we can get these to turn around really quickly. With proper care, you can take care of something like that. Absolutely. This is, um, I'm just, I think I just went it back. It takes a second. No, nope, proper wound care. Oh. Very rarely does this, this wound very rarely qualifies for the hyperbaric chamber. Oh, I, see. Um, I would love to get these into the hyperbaric chamber, but um, once I get into that slide, you'll see, unfortunately, there's limited qualifications for it. But um, yes, by proper care. So compression is a mainstay. Um, proper ultrasounds to identify the problem, selection of, of dressings, debridement, and that'll end up on a slide. Uh, but yes, absolutely, without any doubt, there's not a picture that is on this slide right here that we don't see regularly, um, very regularly. In fact, and that includes that bottom. And absolutely, they heal. They may not hit our 23-day uh, goal and median days to heal, but absolutely. And then this was is just an, exemplifies the difference between a healthy wound like you'd expect a cut in your arm is that top left the things that you expect to heal and infected wounds or slow to heal wounds just this is another venous leg ulcer that you can see here on the screen these are some of the advanced services and the things that the tools in our tool belt i kind of think of it like a batman's tool belt if you can can think of it that way i don't know but uh the things that we do to help these wounds heal um Negative pressure wound therapy. So wound vac is, um, is an amazing tool depending on the specific wound. Debridement is exceptionally important. So on a regular basis, we're going to encourage that wound to heal by using sharp instruments across the top of the wound. It takes it off bacteria, that seed on the top of the wound. It makes the wound, uh, uh, it, it, it encourages it to heal like you'd expect your body to heal. So as these wounds last, as they're there for an extended period of time, they perpetuate themselves and they slow themselves down essentially. Your body, although it does a lot of amazing things, sometimes in the wound world, it, it actually slows itself down, it hurts itself in the wound healing process. So surgical debridement reduces infection, improves healing. Compression, compression, a lot of compression wraps in our clinic. Different type of medications. There's a few topical ointments, very few that help to take that dead tissue off and keep those wounds good, clean, healthy. Advanced dressings. These are some of my favorite. These are great. So the two that you're seeing, I love yeah. this stuff. So the... I remember it was... <laughs> <laughs> so these, um, these are really neat. So the two that you can see here, um, I use as frequently as possible, but there's small qualifications for these. So the one that I have the mouse on right now is living placenta. They have the ability to um, sterilize this, but this is taken off of placenta. It is stripped of the membranes that are not appropriate to be placed back on the human body. And um, this is the only dressing right here, it's called Affinity, that has living placenta that we can um, use for wound care. And then this is called Aplograph. This one is um, grown out from the foreskin of babies. The source was back in the 80s, so it's replicated cells, but that was the origin of the cells. So they keep all the growth factor, stem cells. We can't call them stem cells once they're out of the body, but um, uh, and all of the necessity to help your body heal. They don't become skin, but they help encourage these wounds to close. So it goes applied and then removed? Yep, so traditionally we apply on a weekly basis. We traditionally apply them on a weekly basis. There won't be much left to those dressings after a week. Your body will utilize all the growth factors, stem cells, and that the placenta is tissue. It'll get broken down by the body. This is actually a collagen uh, dressing that the all the um, stem cells and growth factor are grown out across. And so that your body will utilize that just like it uses collagen to um, regrow skin, and but it won't become new skin itself. It just encourages it. So it's not like a skin graft per se. Wow. Now, like when I have my babies, 
Can I have donated it, my the placenta, or do they have to ask you that, or do you, they just use it now if it's throw, being thrown? That's a really good question. I do know there's a process. I feel like there is a form I filled out. It's been a few years since I had a baby, but oh. there is a check or something that I had to mark on it, kind of like donating your there's, body. It had to have changed recently because I don't ever remember that, but I do remember reading mm -hmm. about the uses of placenta. And then you don't have to worry about what blood type? Not on these. Okay. No, not by the time it gets to this point. Right. So um, I mean, they're, I they're very universal in that sense. Would be able to utilize, even just one would be able to utilize a lot of product. It takes some time, but they absolutely, without any doubt, speed the process. And maggot therapy, I don't use it often. Um, <laughs> when I went to West Branch, their providers, uh, she's been in one care a long time. She still has used it on occasion in particular areas, but I cannot say in the three plus years that I've been here that we've used it, but it is always out there. It's an option. They're sourced, they're sterile. There's one source in the entire country for them. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy. All right. Grab these. Or, sure. All I'll right. start this one out. Um, so this is, um, we'll pop back. There we go. Okay. So this is an actual picture of our hyperbaric, one of our hyperbaric machines. It is a re medically recognized treatment option. And this is a, um, a clear acrylic container and the patient will actually go in there. We have a hospital bed. The hospital bed's not in there, so you can't envision it. Um, but the patient will lay on a hospital bed and they essentially just roll open the big door, roll right in, shut the door. And then while they're in there, they're going to be uh, receiving pure oxygen in a pressurized environment. Um, and Jake is going to get into the nitty gritty of how exactly that works. But the next slide is kind of cool, just another fun story for you, um, just to kind of give you an idea of how amazing hyperbarics really is, the things that they can do. So in 1959, just before 1960, there was a doctor, Dr. Eit Borima, um, and he kind of wanted to see test limits, essentially. And so... Um, him and his team took this uh, team of pigs and they had replaced all of the blood essentially um, in the pigs with Ringer's lactated solution. So RLRS and plasma. So essentially what they had done is removed all of the hemoglobin or at, at least enough of the hemoglobin that that pig would not have been able to survive on its own. Um, hemoglobin is kind of what helps tra oxygen travel throughout the body. So once they did this, they had, or before they did, they already had the, the pigs in the hyperbaric chamber. They were under three atmospheres of pressure while they were in that chamber. And those piglets were able to survive for 45 minutes um, while they were in there. They were taken, they were then reinfused with their own blood, taken out of the chamber, and they survived. So this has been replicated many times and um, probably not something that you would see nowadays because research has changed a little bit, but just an interesting kind of background tidbit um, and that uh, just the amazingness that uh, hyperbarics can do with really um, under that pressurized environment. Another kind of cool background uh, fun story for you. So it's the Cunningham Sanitarium. It was built in 1928 by Dr. Orville Cunningham, and it is the was the largest hyperbaric chamber in history. And so this doctor said, you know what, I'm going to build a sanatorium. He thought he could cure cancer and cure mental illness with this pressurized oxygen. So that entire sphere that you're seeing there, that is a hyperbaric chamber. And it was actually a hospital. They spared no expense. They had vaulted ceilings and fancy dining rooms. And it was just a state of the art thing. Um, and it was going to cure all. Well, it didn't. Um, hyperbarics can help a lot, but it doesn't cure everything. And it was very, very expensive to um, run that. So um, he ended up selling it a few years later for, I want to say like a couple million, but not, I, or maybe it was just 1 million uh, to a gentleman who tried to continue on as just an oxygen therapy, uh, almost like a, uh, like a spa, essentially. And that didn't go very well. So um, they tried to turn it into just a regular hospital 
that also wasn't sustaining. So eventually they ended up just dismantling it in 1942 and they sold just the steel for 25,000. And that original cost in 1928 was 1 million. So you can imagine in today's standards, how much that would really cost. Um, what we have today is we no longer have giant sanitariums, but what we do have is the single use chambers. So um, we're at the top, this one is what, oh, mouse doesn't quite follow like my hand does. That's the most common one. Like I said, that's what we have. That's what you're going to see in the My Michigan and Hologic centers. Um, the guy with the horse, they do use hyperbaric medicine in veterinary medicine as well. And then down at the bottom, that is a multi-place chamber. Those, um, I think there's in Grand Rapids, right? That's all that I know of. Yeah. Um, and those are a little bit different than what we use in that the hyperbaric technician actually goes in with the patient. And where these are kind of more useful is if we have critical care patients who need a lot of extra care, maybe are hooked up to a lot of machines, they can go in one of those chambers and then it wouldn't um, How many times can a person go in to a hyperbaric chamber? For example, they fell in a blue outfit there. I'm assuming he goes in there daily. How does his body handle that? That's it. I'm really glad you're asking because we were literally standing here before this presentation. I have not seen any. Question. Oh, yeah. So the question is, is specifically, it was noted on the slide that there is a hyperbaric technician that goes into the hyperbaric chamber. That's his role. That's his job. That's what he's doing on a fairly regular basis. You'd assume probably daily. Um, how often can they go in there? How does the how do daily treatments in a hyperbaric chamber affect them? Does that seem to sum it up? And I can't answer your question, but I can guarantee you after today, I'm going to dig into it. Tammy and I were just discussing it. I've not heard of any long term, short term, any incidents specifically related to daily treatments with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. But just like anything, hyperbaric oxygen therapy has risks. And every one of my patients before they go into the chamber know that as well. So when you start to think about it, that they are absolutely more, you would think at least in theory, that they're more prone to some of the problems that can occur with it. Although it's safe, it, it has potential, but I can't give you a, a, I can't give you that information. It, it'll be on my it'll be on the plate for for uh, this afternoon though for sure. Come back next year for a talk. <laughs> hopefully, we'll have that. <laughs> it was that type of the multi place, yeah. And met several of us. This was, I think, in the eighties. Is that right? It sounds appro yeah, approximately right. Yep. Eighties. And several of us trained to be. Um, as nurses to go into the chamber because we were using it for critical care patients mm -hmm. then. Yeah. And we were and somebody had to be in there. You can't just leave a critical care patient right. for four hours by themselves because they need some care. Um, a lot of people had ear, middle ear problems, but I don't remember anybody having other issues. That is the num the most common thing that you see. People will say their ears start to kind of feel plugged, kind of like if you're in an airplane and that's from that pressure. Right? So you can loosen your jaw. Um, our hyperbaric technician is very good at watching for those signs as well. So she'll even, um, she can give the patient an air break where they're just breathing regular air and that'll help, help decrease that as well. All right. So we're going to get into what are the indications and I'm going to pass it back on over to Jim. And then... So approved indications, mm. um, these are non-emergent. These would be what we would have patients in regularly throughout the week. Um, also, not only the frequency, but where we really get to see it shine in wound care related specific problems. So, um, acute peripheral arterial insufficiency. So. I'm going to skip the circled ones because those are by far, bar none, the most frequent reasons that somebody goes into the chamber. So I'll circle back around to the, the circled ones at the end. So severe peripheral vascular disease with risk of limb, but it has to be in combination with surgery. So it makes it pretty tough locally. Uh, traumatic peripheral ischemia. So crush injuries that will actually be duplicated over here on crush injuries. Um, Severed limbs, so repaired severed limbs. Again, not something we're going to see here very frequently. Not very many surgeons here are going to um, reattach limbs, but um, potential for indications. 
Two indications we use quite frequently here locally, though, is soft tissue radionecrosis. So I'm going to skip around a little bit. Um, can you guys see that up on the screen? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And then osteoradionecrosis. So um, radiation injury, so delayed radiation injury after um, cancer treatment. So radiation cancer treatment, both of those. And we have absolutely, without a doubt, had multiple, uh, multiple patients in for both of those and try to regularly if we can. Prep and preservation for skin grafts and flaps. So if you had a skin move from one part of your body to the other to cover up an, a wound or, or a surgical site of any kind, and that fails, that's an indication. Necrotizing infection, so flesh-eating bacterial infections. Again, in combination with surgery, there's pretty specific um, parameters. Oh. Um, the two that are circled, though, are are our most frequent uses for hyperbaric oxygen therapy for wound care specifically, and that's diabetic um, wounds of the lower extremity. It requires a severity, a length of time, standard of care, but there's a qualifying uh, component to that. And then chronic refractory osteomyelitis. So that is a bone infection that's gone through what we consider standard of care. So six weeks of IV antibiotics traditionally, along with surgical intervention and appropriate dressings that hasn't healed and is still present. So along with treatment, retreating that, that bone infection, we can also use hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And then the two emergent indications that we see are carbon monoxide poisoning, and that's our most common use for the hyperbaric chambers for an emergent indication. And then decompression sickness or the bends. Really the origin of hyperbarics all stems from divers, Giving the bends, so um, that is uh, that is another one of our our reasons for using it. It works. It, this is going to be a brief overview of how it works, and then go into a little more detail on the next slide. But um, it's direct pressure reduces bubble size, so it is pressure and oxygen together. When you apply pressure to the oxygen molecule, it's going to compress it, and it's smaller. Um, delivers oxygen because we're able to hyperoxygenate the body with a combination of high percentage of oxygen and pressure. We can actually get the, um, the plasma or the liquid portion of the blood. So there's the red portion are those red blood cells that carry oxygen, but the liquid portion of the blood, we can actually saturate the liquid portion and deliver oxygen that way. So then that promotes angiogenesis and neovascularization. And there's, there's absolutely a slide that's gonna make that make sense. So um, it helps aid in killing bacteria, helps with the effectiveness of our antibiotics, <sighs> limits white blood cell adhesion. Um, so in er after severe peripheral vascular disease, once areas are opened up, you can end up with um, a secondary injury to the site and it can help reduce that. Not the main indication, really one through three is why we're usually using hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So this was uh, Boyle's Law. Oh boy, it's been, been a few years for some of us and before I got back into hyperbarics a few years for me before I started getting back into physics. But um, so the pressure, the given quantity of gas varies inversely to the volume. Increase pressure, decrease volume. The more that you can deliver, your lung has uh, a total area that it can absorb in the capillaries, in the small in the small areas of the lung where it can absorb oxygen. And um, we decrease the volume, and we're able to get more into the body. So, angiogenesis, uh, new angi. I think there's a slide. Okay, it's going to go over it right here. No, that's coming up. Sorry. Um, There's a lot of words on here, but this is this is basically what this is. And I try to I have this conversation really frequently with my patients. So this is the encouragement and development of new blood vessels, new capillaries, and the growth of tissue. It all starts with new blood vessels, new va neovascularization, angiogenesis, new development of those vessels. So it starts out with the very first portion of tissue growth being that an improvement and increasing. And that is what is perpetuated with hyperbaric oxygen therapy and what, that's what moves it along. Helps to aid in the um, antimicrobial activity. So this is those infections, that bone infection, that necrotizing infection, 
oxygen-free radicals, bacterial replication is inhibited. There are particular bacteria, especially anaerobic or oxygen bacteria that replicate in an oxygen-free environment that um, produce toxins. And a lot of times that is the response you see in these patients. Um, and uh, it's not the bacteria itself, it's the toxins that are, that are produced and that's inhibited. Helps improve the effectiveness of our antibiotics, our antimicrobials. Um, improves our white cells. So our white blood cells are what help fight infection, our body's infection, infection fighting, and it helps with that as well. Yes, sir. Is there a general number of minutes for a treatment? For, for a treatment? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. So, our oh, thank you. Yes. So is there a general number of minutes for treatment? So that is a dependent, but yes, absolutely. So when we treat our patients on a daily basis, their treatments are approximately two hours. So they're with us Monday through Friday for two hours. So for those two indications, the diabetic ulcer and chronic refractory osteomyelitis, we usually have around 40 to 60 treatments that we're gonna have these patients in. It's a Monday through Friday, a two hour treatment. So they're with us quite a bit. How many people can you handle with, say, your, with your um, material there? How many people could you handle in one day giving that kind of treatment? Uh, we've done seven. Um, we've had seven for about a month and a half stretch. That was a push. If we extended clinic hours, which is what we're looking at, we can do eight. Beyond that, we're, that's, that's, Pretty well tapped me out, but generally, I, I don't know what the average is. I would be shocked if it's anything less than three, probably on average, that we have in a day. Everybody have three. We have two machines too, so we can have two people going at the same time. We have two machines. People can go we, the same. we have two machines. Oh. Yep. So the the machine you were looking at, they're sitting side by side. We have two of those. Thank you. Thank yes. Um, does that use every day? Yes. So the question, oh, you have a microphone? They were, oh, excellent. All right. Yep. So every day. So today when I left, we had had our three patients as of right now. So every single day, Monday through Friday. In the, th in the time I've been here, I cannot say that, and this is adding up all of the time together that we didn't have patients. I can't, I'd be shocked if I've been, there's been a month and a half that we haven't had any patients in the chamber. So yeah. nearly continuously. And what thing were you using weekends? Uh, there, one, the data is pretty rock solid with Monday through Friday uh, treatments. Um, for now, this is just, now just for wound care. So wound care, regular treatments that are done on a daily basis, we see some really stellar data with Monday through Friday. Um, personnel, that would be quite the difficult thing to start telling our four staff, three staff members that can run the hyperbaric chamber that they're going to be on it basically every weekend eternally because that's as many as we'll ever have. So um, that would be tough. So the combination of the two, the reality of patients making it in seven days a week makes it pretty pretty challenging as well. We do have hyperbaric call though. Now we have 24 hour call that someone is always on call for hyperbarics for emergent indication. And that's your carbon monoxide or your diving primarily. Those would be our two main. So you always have one provider of some sort and a technician on call 24 hours here. You have two machines at each of those locations? Uh, for the most part, some of them might have one. Um, it depends on the size. I yeah, know West like... Branch has two, Midland has two, we uh, Alpina has two. Alma, Claire, and Gratiot, I, I couldn't tell you. They might just have one. They might have two. I will look into that as well. We have homework. <laughs> so, but can I make a comment about the emergent care? Yeah. We're the farthest north that does emergent hyperbaric. So we get people flown in yes. um, from the Upper Peninsula or even last summer, I think it was, we had somebody from Wisconsin to come for, for um, emergent care because otherwise Absolutely. they have to go to Detroit or Grand Rapids. Exactly, yep. yeah. 
other places just don't do it. And it works so well with um, having the marine sanctuary, all of our shipwrecks. Yes, yes. We actually had a um, diver within the last couple of weeks, so yeah. everything went well, very smooth. Um, yeah, I would oh, say so. To be done. Dry, dry suits, but yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, she did very well. So I didn't know. I didn't know. Um, so as you, you saw, a oh, sorry, yeah, it's no referral needed. Could I pick up my phone and make an appointment? Absolutely. So these are all of our branches that we have and we all work together and we make sure that you get to the closest center to you because we work together. So um, if we can't see you, we'll even try and get you into another center. Right now, our days to admit are about three days. So from the time that you call us, it takes approximately three days to get you in to see Jake and our awesome team. The ways to get to us, there's essentially two main ways the first and which is probably the the best most recommended would be to go through your primary care provider they can lay eyes on it and like i said we do work with them very closely we're sending progress notes um letting them know what we're doing so that's probably the best but some people don't have a primary care provider or they can't get in uh, we talked about if you have a diabetic ulcer foot ulcer you can go from a pinhole to a large ulcer in a matter of days. And if your primary care provider says it's gonna be weeks um, before you can get in there, you can always just call us. So our address is on there, our phone number is on there. No referral is needed. We check all insurances, um, you know, to make sure we take your insurance and whatnot. So you can always just call. And then even if you did just call and get in, we would st we can still work with your primary care provider. Is that a central scheduling number? That is not. That is our direct number. So that will go right to the wound care center. But a family member who's primary referred to wound care gave him the central scheduling number. And he called twice and never got a call back. Oh no, That's horrible. that is not good to hear. But yeah. Okay, so I'll have to work when I go out and educate the providers to make sure they're giving this direct number because I think you can sometimes get lost in the shuffle if you call central scheduling. We do um, have a, a, a system epic where providers can put a referral in there and it still comes to us, but sounds like maybe that person got lost in the shuffle. So that's good to hear. I we will. Went to the diatrist who treated the wound. Okay. And, apparently it's here. and sometimes that's appropriate. Yeah. We uh, Jake works very closely with the local podiatrist here. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Uh, well, I have several things. <clears throat> First of all, I have a friend who um, ended up, uh, she was essentially born dead, but came back and then has brain damage and, and has um, cerebral palsy. So they went and looked into hyperbaric over and they end up having to go to Canada. This was several years ago. And it was, I don't know if it, it didn't heal her. I mean, she still can't walk or talk, but um, uh, the interesting thing that they noticed too was the hair, how much her hair grew in that oh. amount of time. So that was, that was the interesting, interesting. thing. Um, the other thing that for myself, I have a lot of nerve damage. Can you help at all with nerve damage? I um, have seen Dr. Shell, I'm going to have uh, surgery on my arm, hopefully, uh, to um, relocate the nerve in my arm so that hopefully I can be out of pain and have a little more movement with my hand. Um, can we have any research on nerve damage? So I can't quote any studies specifically on uh... To make sure I'm careful with that. Yeah. Because uh, is it okay? So because I have neuropathy. Yeah. So we see we see improvement with things like that in the hyperbaric chambers in circumstances where people qualify for hyperbaric oxygen therapy. We you what you began to mention with hair growth, we've actually seen some amazing um skin autoimmune psoriasis, some this essentially skin clearing, some really incredible outcomes. The problem is qualification and insurance coverage. So right. there is no high quality data studies that could tell me that one, you would have improvement with it. 
Two, that the risks outweigh the benefits. And without any doubt, no questions asked, there's not an insurance company that would cover it. So where that leaves us, it, it puts us in a really bad place in the sense that there are conditions out there that are being studied. And I absolutely, without any doubt, believe in the next five to 10 years, we are gonna see a tremendous in increase in approved indications for hyperbarics if we can get insurance on our side, if we can provide enough data. But until then, it's very challenging, especially in a small center. We don't do clinical trials. We can't do clinical trials. Um, to to be able to treat in an off-label, that's what that would be considered, an off-label indication. We have pushed two off-label indications since I've been here, but they were very well studied, very well documented, just not approved by insurance. And they, um, they came from a referral, so it was a GI problem, and it came from a gastroenterologist at U of M who is a well known in the pediatric world. So it was such a small, narrow scope that we were able to talk with my Michigan, knowing that there's the potential for non-payment. We were able to go move through with that. It's not a it's not reality to do in any type of regular basis. And unfortunately for that, I'd be shocked if we could get approval. Okay. Not that I could tell you it couldn't be potentially. Right. So did they were you able to follow through with that patient? Short term improvement, long term none, unfortunately. Okay. It was really, yeah, but Short term was, looked great. Yeah. So you get. But again, it wasn't nerve regeneration or anything like that. It was right. very, very different circumstances. Right. I was just hoping maybe after the surgery that I could, uh, you know, say, hey, I'll be a clinical. I would, lo I would love for <laughs> that. that. Cool. I'd love for that. Okay. And then, um, well, we kind of already talked about dollars. So, airport oxygen, you know, that's so. Everybody's saying when you go to the airport, they have those oxygen places where you go and sit and have oxygen. You know what? Uh, your opinion? I mean, that ha it has really nothing to do with hyperbaric, but is that really? I, I guess it's a money maker. I, I don't. I don't know any. Without using, I. I mean, oxygen is great, but until you get to the levels that, that there's no good clinical data that oxygen that you breathe without the combination of pressure gets you to a level that is going to be beneficial. beneficial. So yes, so the, it's the pressure. That I can exactly. That is the requirement. So you, yeah. you it, that is why we also have to have you enclosed. Um, there are some products out on the market um, where you shower some oxygen over your wound. I've seen a few of those out there, oh. a plastic bag, you can kind of pressurize it over. The data is not there. It just, I have not seen a single one that didn't have a study funded by the company that produced it that has shown positive outcomes with it. So the, the way we deliver oxygen has nothing to do. You could have a plastic bag wrapped around it. It has nothing to do with that. It's the, what you inhale and what's delivered to the bot, bot, from the body through the vessels to the, to the wound. I just have another question that, that led to... Maybe I'll think of it. <laughs> you can call us. Um, and then I was going to say, we handed out these cards for, you had said your, um, I'm sorry, I can't see her name. Mary? Joe. 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 Um, there are information on the back of these cards too. So you can, there's a whole stack. You can hand them out to your, I'm really sorry about that unfortunate. That's very unfortunate. Yeah. Um, but, well, there's such, I think, so much scheduling goes in there. I yeah. I haven't been called back. Oh, maybe try and call the department. Well, this, I mean, this is too much being done in a central scheduling system. We have to wrap up, but we can do one more question. I thought of it. I had it <laughs> written down. But anyway, um, uh, somebody was, I was saying that I was coming to this and they said, oh, well, you have to go in those things and for so long and you have to be nude. And I'm thinking... No. No, why do you have to be nude? And if you had an assistant in there and you're both in there, it'd be real awkward. <laughs> it would be so, hard to hire. You know, whether it just has to be hot. And it's, you have to wear our uh, gowns. Sure. So, our gowns, specifically the composition of them, are safe to go in the chamber. The props, and pants and everything. If we can help it in any way, for, for all of our sakes, we try not to have people go in there. 
she said that, I'm like, oh my. <laughs> uh, well, thank so you very much.